Hello everyone, my name is Chingyan from the Quantum Communication Lab, National University of Singapore. It's my privilege today to share with you our recent work, benchmarking a quantum random number generator with machine learning. This work is done with my ANU colleagues, Asa and Pinkoi, and uh, with ML experts from the Uni of Sydney, Nan and Omi. Let's start by asking the questions of why do we need random numbers? Firstly, in simulations, scientists use random number to solve complex problems by averaging over random instances and to perform random sampling for statistics. For cryptography, random numbers are required to ensure that the secure keys are drawn randomly for crypt critical applications, such as banking, encryption, and of course, protocols such as uh, quantum key distribution. Finally, for fundamental science, experiments such as loophole-free bell tests will also require randomness that is uncorrelated to the setup. To generate random numbers, people usually rely upon either of these two options, a pseudo-RNG or a true RNG. A pseudo-RNG is typically based on seeded algorithm. Examples include linear congruential RNG, PRNG, which is based on recursive formula, or cryptographically secure PRNGs, which is usually designed to be computationally hard to find out whether the past or the future sequence given the current state of the generator. They could also be seeded by a PRNG. And the second one being true or hardware RNG, where instead of mathematical complexity, it's based on physical processes such as chaotic process and quantum phenomena. When it comes to designing RNG for cryptographic applications, one could ask the following questions. First, is the RNG output uniformly distributed and unbiased? Secondly, is it private or secret? In other words, uncorrelated to any other parties? Consider a case in 2012, where the biggest scan of the TLS and SSH has, has uncovered a widespread of vulnerable keys. In particular, by exploiting the entropy loopholes, for example, initialization with default setting or with poor entropy sources, Heininger and her co-workers have successfully cracked non-manageable amount of private keys. Note that for, say, RSA encryption, which is based on factorization, it's supposed to be computationally hard. So the lesson we can learn here is that if you have a weak RNG for your crypto system, you are essentially leaving a backdoor to your supposedly secure system. It does not really matter how secure or rigorous the other components are, as cryptography is only as secure as its weakest link. Therefore, for cryptographic purposes and applications, one must design or choose their RNG very carefully, and of course, to test it rigorously afterwards. In view of such a security dilemma, QRNG, which is based on quantum effect, in theory, is the perfect solution. First, a quantum phenomena is inherently random, and with access to a pure quantum state, one can guarantee the randomness to be unpredictable and private. Of course, we know that there is a um, device-independent scenario where one instead generates randomness from non-local correlations without assuming the knowledge of the system. While the output might be biased, one can still uh, distill the randomness via an extractor to obtain a close to uniform output. This is all good, however, in reality, the state might not be pure, and neither do we have a noiseless measurement device, nor a QNG that is isolated from the rest of the world. As such, these additional entropies from undesired sources, both quantum and classical, will need to be characterized and modeled properly to ensure that only the trusted and desired quantum entropy are extracted. And we know that this is especially true for device dependent and also for semi device independent RNGs, where some assumptions on the device can be relaxed. Even after all this modeling, our QRNG might still go wrong. For example, it could deviate from our modeling, such as unaccounted noise, some residual correlations, or even assumptions that are unjustified. And there could also be defective parts. Um, when it comes to the random extraction, if the extractor is not chosen properly, when we have such a 
uh, defect, what will happen is that for an eavesdropper uh, who's listening, they might be able to examine the data and use techniques such as big data, machine learning, and so on to estimate or even guess the next uh, output. And hence, the randomness or the security of your QRNG will be compromised. Of course, one can rely on, say, health checking and entropy estimation for the raw data, or for the final output, one can use a statistical testing such as NIST, die harder, and so on. These methods are based on statistical estimators and also predictors. While they are robust, um, they are actually prone to unknown statistical behaviors and long range correlations. And as the NIST uh, SP890 manager once said, no set of general purpose statistical tests can measure the entropy per sample in an arbitrary sequence of values. So this begs the question, can we examine the underlying randomness without first knowing the internal working principle, second without relying on statistical algorithm? And here we would like to propose that uh, we can actually turn an adversarial tools into a diagnostic tool that is with machine learning crypto analysis. Here's a brief outline of the content today. First, I'll introduce to you our QRNG under test, and none will be your tour guide for the machine learning, in particular, how we deal with the data and train our machine. Finally, I'll present to you our results, where we evaluate the performance of our model by examining two scenarios, raw data with partial randomness and post-process data that is almost uniformly distributed. Our QRNG under test is a continuous verbal QRNG where the entropy source comes from the vacuum fluctuation. The entropy is harnessed via the broadband homodyne measurement in which the amplitude quadrature of the vacuum state, which is Gaussian distributed, is amplified by the local oscillator. In our work, we quantify the classical site information in our entropy estimation and optimize our analog to digital converter ADC for maximum throughput. And finally, we post process our output with cryptographic hashing function at advanced encryption standard AES and obtain a final secure bit generation rate of more than 3.5 gigabits per second. Just as a famous quote in the Bible, freely you have received, freely give. Given that our input state comes for free, which is the vacuum state, we also freely share and stream the random numbers online. The website so far has more than millions of receipts, and together with APIs and independent GitHub codes, we have users from all over the world. And for those who are into abstract art, we have our artificial painter here, which gives you random RGB color blocks. And uh, my, one of my favorite is a nice matrix background for smartphone, perhaps. I'll pass to Nan now to explain the machine learning. In recent years, you may have heard a lot about machine learning or deep learning in particular, and what they are capable of. People have been using deep learning in computer vision, speech analysis, natural language processing, medical applications, astronomy, and the list continues. In our work, we use the two most common and mature deep learning architectures namely convolutional neural network and long short-term memory recurrent neural network. So how do we do it? Let's have a look at an example. Given this incomplete sentence, and the task is to fill the blank, many of us will instantly think of a list of possible words that would fit the sentence well. So what helps us is to mean the potential words so efficiently. That's thanks to the given words or the context of the sentence. In other words, if we know the context, we may be able to predict the incoming events. Back to our quantum random number generator. The random numbers are generated continuously in sequence. Now let's link to the example that I gave just now. We can try to estimate the context if any of the quantum random number generator by monitoring its generated numbers. The question will be, can we use reversely generated numbers to guess the next one? We set up our experiment by collecting 10 million numbers generated at each stage of the quantum random number generator. 
We will talk about those stages in the next slides later on. Now with 10 million numbers at each stage, we use 5 million to train our deep learning model and divide the rest 5 million into 5 test sets, each of 1 million. For the training set, we group n adjacent numbers and use them as input to our model or x number 1. The number at location n plus 1 is used as the label for that input y number 1. In our work, we use n equal to 100. Then we skip or slide window by s steps to get the next pair x number 2 y number 2. Here we use x is equal to 3. S can be increased if the training takes too long to finish. We evaluate the performance of the deep learning model by comparing its accuracy with the probability of the number that appears the most frequently in the dataset. CNN has been used widely in many fields. This is a typical architecture of a CNN. The idea of CNN is to capture the spatial information from adjacent inputs or adjacent pixels in the case of image. In this example, we have two convolutional layers. Depending on the problem we want to solve, we can have many more convolutional layers. To the right hand side is the visualization of what a CNN learns after training. The first convolutional layer is able to extract simple features from the input. They are basically lies at different angles. And the next convolutional layers are able to learn more complicated shapes or higher level features. Recurrent neural network or RNN, on the other hand, tries to capture the temporal or time dependent information from a sequence of input. It does that by transforming and storing the past inputs into its memory. In theory, RNN is able to relay the past events to predict the incoming ones. But in practice, RNN has difficulties when useful information is far away from the present. In other words, it has problems with long-term dependency. Long short-term memory was developed to handle this situation by deploying some mechanisms to determine how much a past event should be discarded or incorporated to the memory and the output. Our deep learning model consists of three parts, convolutional layers, long short-term memory layers, and fully connected or multiple perceptron layers. The input are firstly converted to a vector using one hot encoder. Here is an example of one hot encoder. It is used to convert a categorical data into vectors with only one element has a value of one and the rest are zero. Convolutional layers are aimed to extract high level features from the input. Then those features will be fed in sequence to a long short term memory network. The long short term memory network is aimed to extract the time information among those features and fit to the last part of the model, fully connected or multiple perceptron network, where the input is finally classified. In other words, the last part will estimate what number will be generated next. Thanks, Nan. Now back to our QNG setup. In order to test our ML tools, we do an auto spy on our QNG by probing and collecting data from various stages of the QNG. We expect to see some deviation from our modeling, of course, as it is only applicable to a full setup. Two scenarios are considered here. First, we turn off the local oscillator to gather entropy with classical origin, and then we turn it back on to assess the entropy from the quantum source again. Now look at the result. So here we can imagine that given the access to previous output bits, which is the training set, an adversary will buy a good GPU card and then start training over the data. Say if she then compare this over the probability of the highest beam in the training set. And this is what she gets for the classical, which is with local oscillator off, and the quantum plus classical, where we turn the local oscillator back on and vacuum, measure the vacuum state. The first observation that we can get here is that 
more than half of the PG differ from pre-PML by more than two standard deviations. And as mentioned previously, we expect discrepancies since there are likely correlations at various stages of the QRNG separately. Secondly, once the quantum entropy is put back into the system, the ML technique only outperformed the max spin guessing in one case, indicating that the underlying entropy is now less predictable, at least for the machine learning. So let us zoom in the case where the simple estimator p-guess is at most different from the PML. For this scenario, by plotting the power spectrum and the autocorrelation, we see that there are strong periodic traces, or in other words, pick up sickness, and also persisting autocorrelations as well, for both classical and quantum classical case. The stage is actually the stage prior to the final measurement, but without a low pass filter to remove aliases. Hence, our machine learning attack utilizes the predictability in the data and gain advantage in the predicting the next output over PG. While this is a simple example, we believe that by comparing PML with a better estimator in the future, this can be a powerful tool in uncovering more obscure patterns. In the final round, we put two RNGs under testing. First is the linear congruential PRNG, which was introduced earlier, and also the final hash output of our QRNG. We subject them to both the NIST statistical test suits and also our machine learning benchmarking. For this round, we have 125 million of 8-bit data, or equivalently 1 gigabit of data as both the training and testing sets. First, the NIST test. We perform this over the test data set of 1 gigabit consisting of 1000 samples of 1 megabit each. The CRNG, where the output follows this recursive relation, in which the period set by the parameter m passes the test when m is larger than 2 to the power of 28. And expected, the QRNG hash output also passed the NIST test as well. Next, we look at the ML approach. In this round, only the, apart from the QRNG and CRNG with period of more than 1 billion, uh, the rest of the CRNG actually failed the test. And by failing, we mean that uh, the machine learning can predict better than the uniform output of uh, 8 bit. So, uh, in other words, uh, when we look at a case where m equal to uh, 2 to the power of 28 period, even though it passed the NIST statistical test suit, it couldn't hide its true identity of being a fake uh, RNG under the scrutiny of our machine learning police. Here, we would like to comment that while both the NIST and the machine learning tests are aiming at detecting deviation from two randomness, they are operationally different. For the statistical test suit, the uniformity of a sequence is examined through various statistical algorithms. Our ML, on the other hand, targets at the unpredictability aspect of an RNG by learning the previously generated sequence to guess the next output bit. As for the CRNG with period of more than 1 billion, we believe that more data are needed to train the machine learning. To summarize, we hope we have convinced you that you need to invest in your RNG and test it properly if you want to use it for cryptography. To this end, we put forth our machine learning benchmarking tools, which we believe that it will be useful in three distinct manners. First, for an experimentalist or an RNG designer, ML can help you to dissect and examine different components of your device rigorously. For a verifier, an algorithm agnostic benchmarking tools is invaluable in examining both the raw and the hash output. Finally, for end user, they can use this technique to test the entropy for their RNG or even any protocols that involve the use of an RNG. As for the outlook, the crypto analysis attack can be further strengthened by including the side channel information. We are also looking at comparing our approach with the say NIST 
recent publication on mean entropy estimation using predictive model. Forming a hypothesis testing will also allow us to quantify the machine learning performance more quant quantitatively. In terms of implementation, we can also optimize the deep learning model for better accuracy and speed, or explore the possibility of a hardware implementation, such as an FPGA. Our source code is also available on GitHub, where you can find the link below. Special thanks to Hong Jie, who joined the project recently, for helping us to update the codes and making it more robust. As your reward for staying with us till the end, we'll also like to uh, mention that we'll announce a tutorial version of our code on Google Colab during the live presentation um, for QCrit. So stay tuned. And thanks for listening. And we hope that you have enjoyed the talk. If you are interested to find out more, do check out our published paper and the codes under the description below. We look forward to meeting you all during the conference.